Hello, YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Dr. Josie. This is Write Your Acceptance, and this is Claire Ramos. Welcome, Claire. Hi, thank you so much, <laughs> thank for you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. So, Claire, let's start with kind of just chatting through kind of your experience working with me, working as kind of like your journey through pre, you know, pre-med, you feel free to kind of share anything, go in whatever direction. But if we can start with kind of what's been the hardest kind of aspect of applying to medical school. Yeah. So I was born and raised in Texas. I'm from San Antonio, went to Baylor for undergrad. And I decided my junior year to take a gap year because I didn't score what I'd wanted to on the MCAT. My first attempt, I scored a 498. And so I hadn't broken 500 and I knew I could. And so I was like, I'm going to take a gap year and try again in the fall of my senior year to redo my MCAT. And I studied really hard over the summer and I only scored one point higher. And so I was like, okay, we need to readjust everything. And then I took it again one last time in the spring break of my senior year, which like lost my spring break, but it's okay. <laughs> I ended up scoring a 512 and that is competitive for Texas med schools. But I think what stood out for my exact score was that I scored 98th percentile for cars, which okay. for most pre-meds, I think is a really like hard section yeah. from what I've heard from my friends. I always loved cars because I'm a liberal arts major. I majored in medical humanities and we focused a lot on critical reading and kind of dissecting and annotating dense passages. So mm -hmm. that was like my time to shine. I was so ready for cars. And I've always heard like med schools can teach you science. Cars is a little harder to kind of overcompensate for that if you struggle in that. So I think that kind of set me apart, even though my score wasn't like a 520 something. And then for me, I think as far as like applying, the hardest part was writing about myself. I was so used to writing papers in college about something that I had studied really hard on yeah. or, you know, prepped with or was interested in and writing about yourself and kind of doing a introspective reflection is really right. scary and challenging. And also I'm rather a perfectionist. So just trying to start writing and knowing okay. that it's going to be probably bad in the first draft was so hard for me. And I was really struggling, especially with my personal statement, just getting it started because mm -hmm. I knew anytime that I would start a sentence, I'm like, oh, that's bad. Okay. Like, let me delete all of that right. and just start when I just needed to get going and mm -hmm. a big push for me to just sit down and write a bunch of garbage at first and then go back and edit it. No, I love that. And so the perfectionist in you is both kind of pro and con because it'll help you push a mediocre personal statement. And you're like, not going to be satisfied until it gets to where you want it to get to. But then to actually start, sometimes it's, it's really tough for students who are beautiful writers. I mean, you're a lovely writer and you kind of like know how to get to the heart of something very nicely of like an experience and stuff. But, but yeah, sometimes it's like writing paralysis a little bit because of the monumental kind of like, I don't know, role that that personal statement or that secondary is going to kind of take in your application journey. It's, it's pretty wild and right. kind of, yeah, no, for sure. How was your mindset taking the MCAT the third time? The third time I was like, this is it. If I don't do well in this, I really need to reevaluate what I'm doing with my life. Honestly, after the second one, I was already reevaluating just because yeah. most of my friends had only taken it twice. And the people that had taken it the third time were kind of hush hush about it. So I was kind of feeling like, okay, all of my friends that are pre-med either did it one and done or their second time was their redemption. And does this mean that I'm, I just shouldn't be a physician, especially right. because you know that with MD and even DO programs, you have so many exams coming up. Like it's one big test after another. And I have really bad test anxiety where I'm like, okay, I've studied and I've worked so hard. And this one test is going to determine mm -hmm. whether or not I can take the next step. And I knew that, okay, if the entrance exam is what keeps me out the door, what's to say that I can even continue down this path. So I knew that that last temp attempt had to be it because yeah. it was a real like defining moment for me. So yeah. I just went in like being like, okay, this is the last time I'm ever doing this exam. So put everything out on the mm -hmm. little screen yeah. and just do like my best. And I mean, of course I tried my best on the other ones yeah. too, but it was more of a, like, we're jumping off the cliff. 
this is the last time you can try. Did you study differently or it was just like your head game was different? I think my head game was a little different because I was like do or die. But yeah. also my third attempt, I made sure to get a tutor in person. Okay. All the other things I had done like online tutoring or mm -hmm. just like sporadic things. Like I had done blueprint, but it was an online course. And I don't really do well with that just because I need somebody to hold me accountable in mm -hmm. person saying like, oh yeah, I'll get to it on a computer screen has nothing to do with my yeah. brain. Like, oh, okay. Like cool off into oblivion the second that I close my computer. But, and my tutor, bless her soul, like she did her best. But for me, it was more just to have a babysitter. And like someday, yeah. like, what do you want to work on? I'm like, I literally just need you to sit here and <laughs> like, make sure that I do my work. She's like, yeah. okay, do you want me to walk you through a question? I'm like, no, like I literally just need yeah. you here. And so I, I mean, she was awesome. And what's funny is like, she said that cars was her hardest subject. Okay. And, but I don't know if I can like really help you with that. And then like, that was the one that I was like, you know what? That's great. Like I just need <laughs> science, like literally so badly, especially because I was somebody that would study for a really long time. Like mm -hmm. I would do like eight hours of studying and all this stuff, but to do the passages and to right. actually sit and do the questions for mm -hmm. that long, that was a completely different game. So she would kind of find good passages for me on like topics that I needed help with and gather those together and then be like, okay, this is supposed to take you this long. Like, yeah, let's do it. So I think definitely having an accountability person, I think it's kind of hard to do it. If you and another friend are both studying for the MCAT, okay. I think it's a little bit easier to have an accountability buddy that already did it. And maybe you're taking it for the second time, but both of you going in blind is a little hard. I will say, yeah. I saw some friends trying to be their first attempts taking the MCAT and studying. Mm -hmm. And it is a little messy at times. And so I yeah. think it's somebody either that's already done it once or that is done and is just kind of guiding you. Yeah, fair. If you can kind of just open it up and share stats. So we have your 512 as a third attempt. What was your GPA and what was your number of schools that you applied to and kind of why medical humanities? I think that I love to hear about kind of different majors because it really sometimes does round out your experience when I sleep. Yeah. I don't have an exact number for the schools that I applied to. I can get that, okay. but I just hit apply all on TMDS yeah. because I didn't have any particular like schools that I was like, oh, I don't want to go there. Okay. I just want to get in somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I applied all of those schools and I didn't do AMCAS. I, Texas resident, I mean, we have a better shot getting in in Texas, mm -hmm. to be honest. And also I have a lot of nieces and nephews. I didn't want to leave. But my GPA undergrad was 3.82. My first semester, like I did not do well. I'm not going to lie. And so after figuring out kind of what GPA was, because my high school, we did GPA, but it wasn't a big deal for us. Yeah. So I think finding out GPA was very serious my first semester <laughs> yeah. was a bit of a shock. And so it felt like a big uphill climb to just bolster that afterwards mm -hmm. so your major how did you select oh, medical humanities I always hate answering this question and I yeah. was on our council for my major so I had to answer this yeah. a lot my mom found my major okay because thank you, mom. yeah thanks mom <laughs> I knew that I wanted to be pre-med and that was okay. it and that I knew I loved kind of more the literature side of school mm -hmm. I did a lot of creative writing or like AP English stuff, but I enjoyed the honors like chem and honors bio, yeah. but it wasn't a big passion of mine to like only solely focus mm -hmm. on chemistry or bio or biochem. I found them interesting, but I didn't want my whole college career to be focused on that because I knew med school is going to be very science heavy. And so to have those four years where you get to do mm -hmm. kind of what interests you and also hit right. those prereqs because mm -hmm. you're going to have to do those prereqs anyways. Okay. I knew that. And that's all that I knew. And my mom loves doing research. She'll be like up on the computer at 2 AM off of like one thing that I mentioned at dinner. And so mm -hmm. she found about medical humanities before I went to go do my final tour of Baylor. Mm -hmm. And we went to like a little info session, went down and met the, the head of the department. And I was like, I want to do this. And mm -hmm. We ended up actually being a part of a mission trip to Guatemala, which is where my family has been going every year. And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is a sign, like mm -hmm. my major. And then, I mean, I fell in love with it. It was 
a lot of, so medical humanities is kind of like the intersection between the arts of science and the practice of medicine. So it's a lot about talking about the patient physician relationship, what it looks like to be a physician and what it looks like to be in other healthcare roles. A lot of the people that join the major aren't pre-med. They're maybe pre-law and just Mm -hmm. have an interest in medicine or they start pre-med. And one of my best friends now is like a a chaplain for, uh, for actually the medical humanities department right now. She was like one of the first people that I like sat next to in my like intro class. And I was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? I saw, I went the other day to the office and I saw her little chaplain card. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that you were like working for medical humanities. And so I think it gives you a lot of opportunities to change Mm -hmm. your like passion and your career goal Mm -hmm. because they give you those foundations in like what it looks like to be other parts in the medical field. Do you feel like it helped you when you were in kind of clinical experiences? Oh, for sure. And medical humanities, at least in my department, had a class called supervised clinical medicine, where we shadowed different specialty every week. Mm -hmm. And in those moments and having to come back to class and reflecting on those, I could definitely see like the little foundational tools that we got in those intro classes working, seeing like how patients react to certain just simple phrases or Mm -hmm. like ways that we ask, like, do you have any questions or what are your questions? Like those two questions, just how you ask it, ask it can lead Mm -hmm. completely different answers. Like if you ask like a patient that's already just overwhelmed, do you have any questions? They're probably going to say no. But if you say, what questions do you have? that kind of opens it up to being like, oh, mm-hmm. they already expect me to have yeah. something to say. So just That's like- beautiful, yeah. yeah. And so I know that you guys, your class in many ways were kind of like the guinea pig, but can you chat a little bit about the match system for Texas now? Yeah, again, <laughs> I tried not to like look too much into it on no. SDN and all that stuff, but from what I understand, <laughs> and I mean, you can just Google Texas match system explanation yeah. and you'll get it. But basically, whatever schools you interview at, you go into Texas portal and you rank them and you submit that two weeks later, you get accepted somewhere. The way that it works earlier, though, there are some schools that do pre-matches, which basically say, Mm -hmm. if you put us first, you're in. And if you put a second and your first doesn't accept you, you're in and everything below that goes away. But I didn't have any pre-matches. And so when I went into match day, I was just like, somebody please let me in. (laughs) And basically if you match to your third, you're still on the wait list for your second and your first, but everything below that drops off. Right. Okay. Okay. And so basically I'd say, I think it's kind of similar to sorority and fraternity rushing of like, not you rank everyone, they rank Mm -hmm. a bunch of their students. If it lines up well, that right. you really wanted you in that first draft and you were it, that was your top, then you match. Got it. Yeah. Loose, loose ex- explanation of right, that. Right. Again, I try not to like look too much into it because I didn't mm-hmm. want to stress myself out because like, this is the top 100 of that schools. And so I was yeah. just like, you know what? We're going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. That school really liked me the way that I like them. It'll work out. And do you want to share where you will be attending medical school next uh, fall? I will be attending UT Southwestern in Dallas. Okay. How excited. exciting. <laughs> it's real. Right? I know. The yeah. waiting game too is part of one of the hardest parts of the application process. Just yeah. you start in May and you don't find out at least for Texas until February. So yeah. I mean, we've been working together on and off for a, probably a solid year, right? Yeah. Just kind of, and it's all different stages of anxiety a little bit, right? Like, First, you don't know what you're going to write or like how you're going to write your personal statement. Then you're like navigating kind of the whole application. Then it's the secondaries. Then it's the waiting game. So it's just like, it's one layer of nervousness on top of another right. for sure. Yeah. So can you share a little bit about, and I know I'm in kind of the room, but your experience working together. Yeah. Like I said, I had a really hard time talking about myself or just getting started. And a lot of times, especially after I decided like, let's just write garbage and just see yeah. where it goes. It was hard to dissect like what was good and what I just liked because mm-hmm. I felt passionate about it, but that might not be good for medical school. They might not want to hear that 
I love plants in my personal statement, it might be good for somewhere else. And so kind of deciphering what was good for certain sections was definitely hard. And so I think you were very helpful for that deciding Mm -hmm. like, Hey, we can actually save this for another part. It doesn't need to go here. It's good, but not for this. Right. And that was one thing for sure. Another thing was after doing, especially those big, like sit down, just write, just spew, whatever. Sometimes I would get to the conclusion and I'd be like, I know what I need to say. I have 20 things that I need to say. Mm -hmm. How do I get it into one sentence? Now I can't even, I've written two pages. I can't write a simple sentence to just say what I mean. (laughs) And so sometimes I would just be like, okay, look, like I need to say this and this, and I need it to just sound poetic. (laughs) And sometimes (laughs) I just wouldn't be able to. And so we would kind of workshop rephrasing Mm -hmm. just a message in a more cohesive way yeah Uh, when you're just so burnt out from writing and Mm -hmm. everything sounds like gibberish it's just really frustrating run out of words sometimes and I get it (laughs) yeah yeah adjectives I'm like how many times can I say confident and all these other things yeah yeah that's so funny Yeah. I mean, I feel like when I talk to, I I love these testimonials and these kind of short videos on YouTube. And thank you so much for, for joining us today because it, I love them so much because not only do students get to see kind of, this is possible for you, this will happen for you. Right. But also because sometimes I fall short explaining the work we do. It's, it goes so beyond editing. Like we are building your narrative, building your messaging in a way that's like part workshop, part kind of like, you know, brainstorming and then kind of stitching it all together strategically and cohesively. Like it's so much more than just like, this is a fragment. That's kind of, you know, that structure of that paragraph doesn't work. So yeah, yeah, no. And I appreciate you guys kind of sharing your experience for sure. Yeah. One thing I also would mention, and you kind of touched on it is like making your narrative. And Mm -hmm. I felt like at first it was a little bit of like a campaign strategy, of like, what's your tagline? And right. it's because like, as pre-meds, a lot of us have like a big resume of like a bunch of random mm-hmm. things that we were a part of and they're yeah. all, we're passionate about it, but we need to like hone in on something yeah. and gather it all together. And so that we're a little bit more of a digestible package when yeah. we're just in an application form. And so I think that was a big part too, starting off was finding like, what am I representing? What do mm-hmm. I want? put out as like my tagline for sure yeah yeah no awesome thank you so much those are all my questions any final advice to pre-meds out there who are going to start this process very very soon or are starting now yeah I love this try not to worry I (laughs) write that so many times and I'm like you're joking because you're gonna worry and so you can worry but try not to because I heard this a lot too whenever I was like kind of stressed about application, whenever my friends would say you'll bloom where you're planted. And I think that's very true. Like, of course I came into the whole process with like a dream school, Mm -hmm. but honestly, big shocks were that tours changed everything. My first tour, I was like, okay, I need to reevaluate everything. I remember that you were super excited about a tour and then you went, you're like, "Mm -mm, not for me. That was earth shattering for me because yeah. I was so prepped and I was like, okay, like this is it. I can't wait to go and solidify. And mm-hmm. I think that was a little hard because I only applied to Baylor undergrad. I right. had never even toured another school. I was about to start applying to other schools and then I got accepted to Baylor and I was like, I'm not going to do more applications. So I think that was a big thing for me going and touring if you can, because otherwise I definitely would have done my ranking completely differently. And yeah. At Southwestern, they only gave tours to pre-match kids. So I right. I didn't get a tour, but I emailed them. I was like, hey, I really want to rank y'all. I'm having mm-hmm. home. I haven't seen the campus. I'm in Texas. Like I am willing to drive. Yeah. And I, and I see it. And so they gave me a tour. Sometimes just sending an email, like literally yeah. like, the worst they can say is no. Or exactly. no, and you already have that no if you don't ask. So yeah, yeah. exactly. And so I definitely think going in with like an open mind of your schools, like Um, of course you can have a loose ranking, Yeah. but touring big, important thing for me at least, because I definitely think that, well, I actually did change all of my Mm -hmm. rankings and just knowing that every school's good. Like 
if they're an accredited medical school, there's a reason right. they're accredited. They're all right. good schools. And so remembering that mm -hmm. in this application cycle, even though, of course, you can be disappointed or discouraged at times, but like they're all good schools. Yeah. And so no matter what, at the end of the day, if this is what you're passionate about, wherever mm -hmm. you end up is going to be a good fit for you. Yeah, that's awesome. Great advice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, that's it. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions and want to learn about how I work with students, catch your kind of, you know, schedule your call in my Calendly link. The description is below and we'll talk soon. Thanks again. Bye guys.